What, why, why do you have shirts? Go ahead. Fundraising for Belize. What's the story with Belize? Where is it? It is it's in Portugal, right? Capital of Portugal? No? Lisbon. Lisbon. Where's Belize? Is it is it own country? Yeah. Okay. And what's going on in Belize? Why are you fundraising for them? Oh, I understand you want to go over there. What are you going to do when you get there? We're going to run a summer camp. You're going to run a summer camp for whom? Kids that are from pre K, no, not pre K, from like second graders to like 17 year olds. And what are you going to do in this camp? Uh, we got lesson classes together, we got athletic programs. What type of lessons? English, arts and crafts, math, science. And who's the, who's the uh, overarching organization here? Uh, the United States Volunteers, the Jesuit Center. Okay, good. And how many people in this class are involved in this? Why are people hesitating? They're starting to raise their hand and then not. You have a shirt on. Are you the only one in this class? <coughs> Seems like a good thing to do. They have a, a new, like, they have a summer program, and a winter program. And pretty soon they're going to have, like, start setting up a winter program. <coughs> okay. All right, very good. Alfred, do you have something to say? Yeah, I would like to see one of the shirts. Alfred would like to see one of the shirts. <laughs> so you've taken Crystal's logo and uh, and is it Tabasco or Crystal that you've in oh you've actually purchased one right here yeah this is Crystal's logo right yeah so you're you're infringing on their trademark. Um, all right. Uh, so there were some really good, uh, some really good comments after the class last time, and I, I wanted to open the discussion up um, to, to remind you what we talked about last time because I know it was a couple days ago. Uh, we talked about the way forward, the backlash with globalization, and we finished globalization, right? And as part of the conversation, I said um, various things about people that oppose globalization. One of the things that seemed to uh, cause some concern was when I said that those that oppose <coughs> globalization offer no sustainable alternative, right? Do we remember this? And I want to be really clear um, about a number of things. One. I don't advocate good or bad or whatever globalization. It just is, okay? It is what it is. Uh, number two, by saying that no organization or whatever does not oppose a sustainable alternative to globalization, it doesn't mean that a sustainable alternative to globalization does not exist, right? One of the comments was that, uh, you know, the student feels that while I typically, and maybe they were being generous, typically do not impart my own politics into the class, that, that he felt that I veered into that last time. I, I understand where he's coming from, and I apologize if that's the way it came across, but I'm not. I, I really, I, I, you know, my politics aren't important. I'm just trying to lay out what the situation is. The overarching measure, uh, overarching mission of what I was trying to say was that in order for us as a people to exist in a better, kind of more elevated state, we have to confront the facts that globalization exists, right? And we have to confront the facts that if we let it go untethered, then we run very, very serious risks. 
But I am not suggesting that we embrace it wholeheartedly, right? Quite the opposite. I'm suggesting that we create an integration and social safety network because there will be many people in countries that just simply can't embrace it. I would love it if some of the people that came up to me afterwards at this point would chime in. to speak really loudly. Yeah, okay, so was that a question or a statement? Uh, well, I was going to say, I'm kind of worried about that because I feel like the way globalization is working now is kind of more greed and power dominated, so. Let's be real clear, and I don't mean to interrupt you. You are, you are sort of, if I'm understanding you right, coming from a premise that globalization is some sort of organized, orchestrated thing? No. Okay. I apologize. Go ahead. Um, what I'm saying is I'm worried that entrepreneurs might go down a path that's not beneficial to globalization, it's not performing it the right way, and more about making money. Okay. What do you propose? So you don't have a sustainable alternative. I'm just curious about Wait. You're not wrong, right? Look, we, we do things as people based on incentives. One of the most powerful incentives we have, although it, is, it has been proven time and time again that entrepreneurs do not start businesses for money, right? They start businesses typically to solve some problem that is irritating them, right? And, and the money is a byproduct. That said, if you believe the economist Milton Friedman, businesses have one responsibility and one responsibility only. What is it? No. What? Shareholders. Increase the return to their shareholders, right? And he has won the Nobel Prize because it's not as simplistic as it sounds. If you don't increase the value of the wealth of your shareholders, what happens? What happens? You have a business and you don't do a good job. What happens? You go out of business. You go out of business, what happens? What? You don't make any money, you can't hire people. People lose jobs. GDP goes down. Standard of living goes down. That's a huge oversimplification, but there is something to it. The counter argument to Friedman is a guy named Freeman. Freeman says that you have to take care of all of your stakeholders, including your customers and everybody else. Okay. Both of these people are premising a free market liberal economy, right? Where we have not a central allocated resource, but business people starting businesses. It's flawed. People will do bad things to make more money. Absolutely. What is the alternative? So, we're, yeah. They will. I love it. I hope so. I think there's an argument to be made that yes, the Enrons of the world will crumble. The, the Bernie Madoffs of the world will crumble. Toyota got bad somewhere along the way. We didn't see it happening. Somewhere along the way, Toyota, this company that for years and years and years and years was the pinnacle of quality. And I mean that in the business sense of the word, reduction of variance. Every car part will be exactly the same. Any of you all interested in, in productions and operations management, things like Six Sigma, things that are, you know, they, they set the bar for quality, right? Something happened along the way. We didn't know it while it was happening, but what's the net impact of them screwing up? They lose customers, and now they got two choices. Or, yeah. So, and during that time, what happens with respect to their competitors? Um, they look better. Gain market share. Yeah. Go ahead. I see in more companies uh, 
Louder. Has the immoral, like the bad companies, fail more companies to <coughs> start that are going to be just as immoral? It's like a repeating process. weird place, right? Um, as, as an industrialized society, we've moved from sort of a pre-modern landscape, and we've talked about this, where your success or failure is dependent upon your resources, right? Your, your kind of top-down management, all of those things, all of the things that made Detroit a, a huge industrial success for 50 or 60 years. It doesn't work anymore, right? What is beginning to emerge, and it's, it's emergent, and it's what, what you talked about with social entrepreneurship. We're beginning to see um, businesses and cultures of information. And when you get there and you increase transparency, right? And you increase transparency in order to reduce transaction costs. And I want to be, I know that's a lot of big words, but I want to try and be clear. The more open I am in today's economy about my business, the more likelihood I have of getting customers. Is that a fair or false thing? Okay. So if that's true, who will get more customers, the ethical or to use your word, moral business or the unethical or immoral business? Right. So given that, we're starting to see, and I could be wrong, it's just observational, we're starting to see a shift where transparency matters. Part of it is the internet. The internet shines a very, very bright light on mediocrity. Put simply, it's harder to lie. Okay, you will get caught faster. There are costs associated with that lie. Whereas in the pre-modern era, you could lie and fool your customers. Smoking is good for you, okay? There were commercials out there, and you watch Mad Men, know this. Smoking is good for you, okay? Harder to do that. Impossible, absolutely not. Will there be different schemes that, that, that you know, to take the transparency and, 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 you know, manipulate it to their own nefarious ends? Absolutely. But there is a shift in the culture, and I think it's best embodied by this principle of social entrepreneurship, where we're saying, look, we are going to embed into our businesses <coughs> Transparency, reduced transactions, giving stuff away in order to become more profitable. And we move from places like Detroit, which were closed. We have a patent on this particular type of engine to open source, to here's what we do. Take our thing and use it with your thing. Twitter has built an entire industry <coughs> around people building things off of the Twitter API. An API is just a, a, a little piece of information that you can grab from one website to another and make them talk to each other. Farmville is a, what, $100 million a year company. Farmville. I'm talking about the app. Okay? Zynga or something is the name of the company. There are platforms being built where we have whole new economies. I've said it before. Detroit 50 years ago versus Silicon Valley 50 years ago. Silicon Valley was a lemon grove. Okay? Bangalore, India. Is this all pie in the sky? A little bit. A little bit. Are there always going to be bad people that manipulate systems for their own end? Yeah, absolutely. Is this relevant to globalization? Globalization, yes, because who has things at stake? Everybody. Everybody. Right? So if we're all got our skin in the game, and I am running Farmville, I want to keep doing it, right? And if I'm Google, and I'm pissed off at the way the energy companies are running things, what do I do? What do I do if I'm Google, and I'm pissed off at the way the energy companies are running things? I buy them. <laughs> That's what they've done, okay? 
So these pre-modern institutions, do I know what's going to happen five years from now? Do I know what's going to happen five seconds from now? No. But I am seeing the shift and change. And I don't like what I had to sort of impart up here, right? I don't like this idea that the olive trees are getting chopped down. But I think we can do something about it in the context of globalization. And that's all I was trying to say. All I was trying to say is if you remove yourself from that system and say, not for me, you're going to have trouble. If you get within the system, you've heard this from people, affect change from within rather than from without. Build something great. You can affect that change. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Does that make any sense? Who else? Can you see me? Go ahead. You're just you're just saying that it in fact does make sense, or do you have a point? But you disagree. It's okay. I, I, I give you two points on the test if you disagree, and you can articulate why you disagree well. <laughs> You have to speak loud enough so I or anyone else could possibly hear. I don't believe that globalization will just destroy the culture. I mean, I feel like culture will always be. Can anybody else hear him? Am I just old and deaf? Okay. Um. <laughs> you realize that I yell for an hour and 15 minutes every day. Yeah. Okay. So you can yell for 30 seconds. Okay. Um. I don't believe that globalization. Or maybe not. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I really, I really want to hear what you have to say, but if you're going to require me to come up here and sit, then I'm going to have to yell it back to the class. I want them to hear it. It's not about me. Okay, I don't believe that globalizations can eventually converge everything. Okay, good. Um, me either. I, I believe that uh, you know, the globalization will eventually hit a point where it has to either everyone will rebel against it or the, the See, that's horseshit. Everybody is going to rebel against it. You're not thinking. What does that mean? The countries that aren't in the United States or some big superpower are going to rebel against it. People, countries are already rebelling against it. That's what I'm saying. So what will they do? What would their rebellion be? Because we talked about this. We talked about the French turning cars, not the French, people in France turning cars over, rebelling against it, right? So but what were they proposing? What was the sustainable alternative? They don't really have one. It's just they're just rioting. And it, it makes no sense to just sort of riot, but it just needs, they just need to like, continue on with what, what their culture says is right. Say, uh, but if their culture can't feed their children, what, how will they continue on? Um, well, they can farm. Uh, they can farm. I, really I remember when I was in 10th grade, right? I was in <laughs> biology class. And I have my good friend Matt Branca sitting next to me. And Matt was a, a troublemaker. My three-year-old would say he made a lot of mischief. And uh, the teacher was talking about how we'd all be in trouble if we ran out of water. And Matt raised his hand and said, what about syrup? <laughs> and for a minute, the teacher said, no, you can't have syrup. You wouldn't have trees full of water. Anyway, so farming is your suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> uh, the alternative, yeah, I think will eventually show up somehow. I don't really know what it is. I hate that. Yeah. I hate I hate the alternative will show up somehow. You know why? <laughs> no, I mean, there's that. It's also because, I mean, if anything I'm trying to teach you guys is to take control and to take the power right. and to take the <laughs> destiny rather than waiting for some ephemeral hand of God to come down and say, yeah, you know, it'll work itself out. Will it work itself out? Probably. But I would rather have you say, I'm going to figure out how to work it out. I really, and I, I mean that, even many of you are musicians waiting for some record label or manager or agent or whatever to come down and say, your songs are so dope that I'm gonna give you a record deal. Guess what? It's never gonna happen, okay? Unless you get out there and play and build a profile and everything else. And if you think that these countries need to go out there and do something, then, then do it. I don't disagree. I don't want passivity. And that's ultimately what, I mean, remember I went and hid behind the chalkboard and said, you know, this is what, if you keep getting back, you hot. I don't want that. I, you have a good mind. You're smart. I want you to, to push it out there and not be passive, right? <coughs> so to say that it's just, it's something, it'll figure itself out, 
I don't like that. Yeah. You know what I call that? I don't know. Not off the top of my head, no, but I bet you're going to tell me. <laughs> I'm sorry? Dropping my nuts. <laughs> now, if I was an older faculty member, I'd say, but my nuts have already dropped. <laughs> why, would you, why would we call it dropping your nuts? Because it's called, I mean, you know, you got to bring some balls and get out there and make stuff happen. I mean, it's that, like I said, when she was just talking about what you think about uh, this chat, I seen it on Facebook. Yeah, well done. And That'll work well. And what I said, you know, it's like the way he said that you had he had to make a radio song. And I said the only thing that makes a radio song is if your song is played on the radio. And so <laughs> what you need to do is make your music and if you are if you good and if you really talented, then you're gonna make people come to you. And you don't Wrong. have to you don't have to be about it. If you're good or talented, I mean that, that's the if you will build it, they will come live. <laughs> That may work for Kevin Costner and James Earl Jones. If you are good, and you, and what is good, by the way? You gonna tell me what's good? You don't know what's good. You know what's good for you. I can promise you there are things that I think are good that you think are whack and vice versa, right? So what's good? We don't know what's good, okay? What's good is being able to do whatever it is that you do, make enough money with it so that you get to do it again. That's good. You make the money by being good. No, you do not make the money by being good. Absolutely not. Everybody in this classroom is good, okay? But they're not making money off of their music or whatever else they're doing. You make the money by having a strategy that generates revenue. Well, I mean, that's, that's true too. No, 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 not true too. That is true. No, but you can make the revenue whether you're good or bad. You're starting from a false premise. I don't know, because if you don't have a good product, it's What you is a good product? That's what I'm about to tell you. All right. That's what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> the iPhone. Okay. That is overall a good product. Yes, I think we can all agree that the and iPhone you, is a good product. And you if you, and I will, let me, let me cl clarify things. If you are the Pixies, if you are Chuck D, if you are Jay-Z, just being good will probably get you there. But most people aren't the Pixies or the iPhone or whatever. Most people are pretty good. They don't suck. But then they evolve and they generate a revenue stream so that they can go from here to there. If you are birthed a genius, you'll probably be OK. But that's not really relevant, and it's a real bad business plan. Well, I mean, it, it, it's like it's, it's saying it's a, moral, it's a moral company. You know what I'm saying? If you start off with bad morals, people are eventually but that's a business decision. You're, ta you're making an artistic decision and trying to equate that with revenue. And that's bad. Well, Being a, I running don't see a, why it don't go hand in hand. Because, I mean, people eventually start realizing that you have a bad product and stop buying No, they won't. Product. They won't even know unless you market it. You can have a good, bad, indifferent well, product. That's what I mean by dropping your nuts. Ah, <laughs> that's fine. Fair enough. So the business plan is to drop the nuts. I like it. I'm going to use this. You know I'm going to use this. I will give you credit. Maybe. Got somebody had a hand up. Feel like a talk show host. What? <laughs> Build something that you think is great. Don't do it from the premise of anything else other than that. Make something that you are deeply passionate about, that you think lie in bed awake at night thinking about, that you get out of bed in the morning and go, I want to do this. Do that thing that you do instead of studying for my test. Make a business out of that. So when you, when you got your book up, right, but instead you're doing whatever, can you make a business out of that? Now if it involves dropping your nuts, I don't know, right? <laughs> but, um, no, no. <laughs> Think about that thing that you're doing that you love and can you make a business out of it and come to class and listen because I'll help you, right? The two go hand in hand, right? 
But no, I, I don't think, it, I mean, I get your point, but no, I think you will probably fail if your goal is I'm going to build a company to make a million dollars or save an allocation. That said, part of your values could be being concerned for the olive tree. If part of your values are making a million bucks, I think you'll fail. Somebody else have a hand? Yeah? I'm worried about the human rights implications. Okay, good. Me too. Describe what you mean by social development. Healthcare or workers' rights. Or I mean healthcare is more of a national issue, uh -huh. but like for example, almost all the shoes in this room are made past the sweatshop. Uh -huh. And yet we have a company <laughs> that, that is, is trying to do something about that and succeed. Yeah. Yeah. But even though there's Tom's, it's like the monopoly of the shoe. Careful. <coughs> monopoly. But go ahead. But the major I know what you're saying. They're so already tied into the, to certain countries that they can make so much money and establish that sweatshops are the model that they're going to do. There's no Be careful. You're thinking great, you're smart, it's good, but but uh, go back to the pre-modern you know, companies and things. If they don't get their act together, is it really um, – a stretch to think that some other company's not going to come up with a better business model, more virtuous business model, and put them out of business. And aren't there lots of examples of that? Sure. Okay. These companies, I, I, you know, Nike and, and what have you, they have to innovate or die. And I think given the market the way it is now and the better <coughs> means of distribution where you can go directly from creator <coughs> to constituent, those efficiencies threaten those companies far more than they do others. Right. Think about music again, and I'm, I'm, I keep going back to music because I know it's where a lot of you guys are part of solar. Ten years ago, if you wanted to get a record in somebody's hands, you had to manufacture it, you had to go through distribution channels. It really was the major label thing. Now, you make a record you want to get in somebody's hands, you don't need that. Right? The record labels are in bad, bad shape. The shoe companies, you're right, but a lot of that's fashion, a lot of that's, and, and there can be competitors. I mean, is it, is it implausible to think that somebody in this class could come up with a shoe company that could compete with Nike. It really isn't. And I think 10 years ago it would have been way harder, although Phil Knight started Nike back in his college in his dorm room. Okay. So where you go with respect, and Nike's had some issues with, with uh, manufacturing. They tend to do the right thing, but they're a massive company, but you can compete with them. And you can have profitable niches. And if we build enough of these profitable niches and connect the values, and maybe I'm erring too far on the side of optimism, but I don't know what the alternative is. It's being sad. But it's for like countries that already have, uh, I guess. Yeah, but you guys are, I mean, you. These one of the main points that Freeman makes is how important the, the, the he called it the $100 PC. It's essentially the $12 internet, I mean, phone, whatever, right? That connectivity really does, for good <coughs> and bad, hold things together. Is, is it. I, had, I, I did a lecture in Brown not too long ago, and, and one of the students there, and granted, this is a Brown student, he's a smart dude, but he comes from a village in India, and now he's going back and buying some specific kind of shirt there, paying them a fair wage, importing it, and selling the bejesus out of it on the ground <coughs> campus. That never could have happened without sort of the technology he's <coughs> advertising through Facebook. You, you know what I mean? So does it answer all the questions? No. But I feel like we've got much more hope now, today, than we did five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, and way more than 20 years ago. What? Okay, so. Not, could you not start a movement around that? I don't see myself using like mobile devices or minimum sort of engagement. No, could you not raise awareness about you said nobody seems to care about it. Could well, you not make people care? Yeah, YouTube, YouTube tried. Nobody cared. 
okay, maybe they didn't do it the right way. YouTube without Google would be bankrupt, okay? Arguing about YouTube's business savvy is not a good argument. They came up with a cool product, Google had to buy them because people were searching for videos. But I, I'm not kidding, if, if YouTube had not been bought by Google, they would have been bankrupt. I, I don't like the argument, well, if YouTube can't do it, I certainly can't, because I don't agree with that. I don't know you from Adam. Do I think it's impossible <coughs> for you to create awareness about this thing that you're talking about? Absolutely not. Do you? I have some doubt. We all do. Get over it. <coughs> Tron? I'm not mad at you. Guys. No, I, I, can't think of, I'm, I can't think of a way. You can't think of a way to do what? You're trying to figure out the alternative. Alternative to what? <laughs> oh, you're, you mean something other than farming? Yeah. Uh, I like farming. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Good, let's give them all two points on the next test, okay? Everybody. conversations, right? We like talking through ideas. I don't have all the answers. I have some more experience and training than you guys do, so I can poke at you and prod at you. But we're wrestling through this together, and it's a lot more fun for me when we wrestle together, right? I'm not mad at anybody. I know I have deep dad voice, as some of my students have told me, but I respect you all. I really do. So let's talk about the central issue of today, facing all of us. Because if we can all create, if we are all good, right? If we're all good, or we all believe we're good, because I don't know any artist that thinks, I'm bad at this, right? Do you? Because if they do, they stop doing it, right? So if you're gonna keep doing it, you're gonna think you're good. So if we're all good, and we all think that, that our whatever, business, music, whatever, should be out there. And we all basically have, and this is kind of my point, we all basically have access to the same stuff, plus or minus, right? Who wins? <coughs> Stronger voice, I like that, yeah. People use their resources to do what? To do whatever they want to do. Who? Their customers? Uh, no, them. They take the resources and? And use that to accomplish something. Good. OK, well, I, I like your spirit. Uh, go ahead. What? We'll drop your nuts, yes. <laughs> so I think we can sum it up to a certain degree. That's the topic of today. <coughs> Test question. True or false? Markets are conversations. Yes. True. Why? Oh, I like Get in their head. Now, is that a conversation or, or brainwashing? No, I read an article about it before I came to class. It's on Twitter. No, please. Because, like, I don't know, you, whoever's on Twitter, you know that when you're on Twitter, every five seconds, you can check out my music. Can't do that. Whatever, right? that, that Why like, can't you do that? Why can't you? What's an RSS feed? I mean, I, Anybody? I, 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 Anybody know what an RSS feed is? What's an RSS feed? reader. An RSS feed is information that gets sucked into your RSS reader automatically. What's a press release? Sorry? You give it to the new, you, you come up with an idea, you come up with a project, you come up with whatever, and you decide you want to get it out there, and you send it out, right? Is that a one-way or two-way discourse? Why? Huh? One way or two way? That's two way. Why? Because in the country we have contact information back. So they have to answer that. Is it a contact?
conversation? If they answer, it's not a conversation. It's one way. You're pushing out. Now, you're right. They could call you back. And, and markets are conversation. Let's think about it for a second. And it relates back to globalization. Pre-Industrial Revolution. What happened in the Industrial Revolution? What does the Industrial Revolution mean to any of you all? When I say those two words, what does it mean? Yes. Railroads, good. Assembly line, manu skyscrapers, manufacturing plants. Henry Ford, you can have any color model T you want as long as it's making the same thing for lots of people fast and quickly, right? This replaced what? Pre-industrial revolution, how do we do business? Trade, trade, agriculture. So I got something to sell pre-industrial revolution. How am I going to do it? Negotiate. Where am I going to do it? Market. Okay. And have, have any of you all ever bought, say, an Oriental rug? Have any of you ever when your parents when they bought an Oriental rug, right? What What happens in that sort of barter? You go in and, and they immediately kind of. That's the way markets always work. You would talk. You would have a conversation. And that conversation did what? Sorry? Did determine the price, but along the way, what else happened? Convince you you want it, convinced, created a relationship, created some sort of bond between buyer and seller where you started to see eye to eye, right? And eventually, the transaction was the consummation of that relationship. In fact, the transaction is just the punctuation at the end. Everything leading up to it is sort of the sentence, the conversation, and then the actual exchange of goods is a period of exclamation, right? So the Industrial Revolution came along and said, forget it. This, this is totally inefficient. We're going to create a supermarket. We don't need no landing schemes, right? We need A and P. We need supermarkets that provide products that are not individualized for the masses, right? And in order to market that, if we've got a product that everyone is going to buy, how do we market that? What do you have to do? What do you have to do? I've created something that I want everyone to buy. How do I market it? Convince that everyone's the same. You all like the same thing, right? Apparently, a lot of you like backward baseball. You are all the same. And you think about the advertising industry that sort of emerged around this time, right? You have white males that had no discernible accents selling you bland products. You had Johnny Carson, Middle <coughs> America values, right? Everything begins to be the same. Did we like this? <coughs> Did we like it? We didn't like it, so what did we do? We lobotomized ourselves because there is no other explanation for generations of people sitting through things like Gilligan's Island. We sat in front of the TV. This is hard for you all to believe. Just sat there because there were only four channels. And on those channels were things like Gilligan's Island. Now, you can debate for some period of time who was hotter, Marianne or Ginger. Are you texting to make sure you figure out who was hotter with the white baseball hat? Who was hotter? Sorry, I didn't hear you. You didn't, didn't hear that question? Why not? What were you doing? Be honest. Can you not? Thanks. So, we debated who was hotter, Marianne or Ginger, but did we really think they were going to get off the island? And we sat there and we watched this. And over time, we built up something called a cognitive surplus. What's that? What's a cognitive surplus? <coughs> think about it. What's cognitive?
cognitive. Thinking. <coughs> Surplus. We had more thoughts than we knew what to do with. Our brains were ready to explode. But the advertisers had to keep us very, very classy. Watch these shows, sit here, buy our stuff. You're all the same. What changed? We never changed. We didn't have a choice. <coughs> what changed? TV shows. What specifically? A four-year-old sits in front of a TV, looking at Dora the Explorer, right, and the boots. She gets up, walks over to the TV in her little four-year-old shoes, and goes behind it, and looks around. What's she looking for? Huh? Eyes on. What? What's she looking for? What's she looking for? A mouse. Explain. They want to play it. They want to interact. They want to do something. They don't understand the TV that I can't touch and drag. How many of you all have found yourself, after working on this for a while, going up to a screen and going, <coughs> right? <laughs> How long is that going to last? The iPad's going to change that, right? So the four-year-old running around looking for the mouse, she can't comprehend a world in which she can't interact and change and customize. Our favorite application, Chat Roulette, is nothing <laughs> if not channel surfing for people or peanuts. <laughs> and we're in an era where finally that cognitive surplus has a way to go somewhere else, right? And so, we want the mouse. We want something else that we can grab. And by the way, there's a lot of people out here that, I mean, this is not, a lot of this is filtered by <coughs> ideas. There's a guy named Clay Shirky that talks about looking for the mouse. I don't want to, I don't want to plagiarize here anybody's ideas, right? Um, but this is what's happening. And so, and this goes back to how we're wrestling with, you know, globalization and all that stuff. A lot of the statements, the very smart statements that you all are making, are still confined to this way of thinking that was sort of industrialized thinking. Well, there's this structure here. It's immovable. And what I'm saying to you is, no, no, no. When you can find that mouse, you can move the structure. And so marketing has changed, right? But let's get to some sort of concrete thing the boring stuff, and then we'll get to the exciting stuff. So here's a marketing definition for you, right? Planning, executing, conception, pricing, promotion, blah, 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 distribution <coughs> of goods. But the key that you want to sort of underline, satisfying. A great product satisfies a want or a need, sometimes a want or a need that we didn't even know we had. Who would have thought that we wanted or needed a blanket that had R in it? That is so garbage. So garbage. Who has one? Look at that. No offense, I'm just saying. No, no. They're making money. Who, who would think we needed a sham wow? So. We have to have some sort of definition, right? And this is our working definition. Now, I, I am diametrically opposed to this. This, to me, is from the book, so I have a duty to report it. I think it's crap. And you should, too. Customer relationship, man customer relationship management. This, to me, and I want you to understand and know what it is. But then I want you to think about alternatives to it. Because it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for exactly the reasons that I just said. We're looking for that mouse. Right? This implies that there is some overlord of marketing that is studying you to figure out your habits and your wants and dislikes and then sort of creating it. I don't like that. 
it makes me feel like I'm being managed and manipulated. You said marketing is getting inside somebody's head, right? Or you're paraphrasing, right? You're not wrong. But I think what that type of stuff and this type of stuff does is reduce us to a bunch of chimps or something. Then we are, you know, as Billy Corgan would say, despite all his rage, he's still a rat in a cage, right? We're just being manipulated to find the cheese. <coughs> I say that we're in an era where we cross through this and put the word vendor relationship management there, where it's about us telling the vendors what we want. And it's up to them to satisfy our needs. And we're getting there, okay? This is sort of an emergent thing. But I want you guys to at least know the term VRM, Vendor Relationship Management. I don't know if I'll test you on it, it's hard. It's the opposite of this, and it's empowering. It goes from you being the passive customer going, give me more Cheetos while I watch Gilligan's Island. Which, you know, look, no one's above that, not even me, right? Probably wouldn't be Cheetos, but you know what I'm saying. To, you know what? I don't want to watch Gilligan's Island, or if I do, I'm going to watch it on Hulu, and I'm going to, you know, skip through whatever, and then I'm going to change it around, or maybe I'll put it on my, I'm going to manage my vendor. Okay, clear? So there's this customer journey that I'm deeply, deeply passionate about. And we talked about at the very beginning of this semester. <coughs> You've got something. A product, a service, a piece of art, a piece of music. You want to, what was the thing? What is it that you want to do? What is it that you're going to do? Say cell phone, you. You did. No, but you told me about a problem. No, not DRM. Something in the cell phone. Oh, the blood minerals. Blood minerals. Like it's how the they're like slave mines. Okay, so they're pulling pulling these minerals out of slave mines to make our cell phones. And laptops. Laptops, whatever. Okay. So you you want somehow to affect change and, and change the work, and change, create awareness about it, right? Make more people know so that we have different options, so that we demand tungsten-free laptops or something, right? In the same way that we now demand lead-free gasoline. It's possible, right? So you've got to take your customer. Who is your customer? I don't know. You've got to figure out who that is and say, I think these people are predisposed to help me raise awareness, because that's the key, have your customers help you raise awareness of this thing. So the first thing you have to do somehow make them know you exist. Right? Make them into you with your music. The first thing you got to make, you just have to exist. With music, it's pretty easy. You gotta get a gig. Right? You gotta go play live somewhere, and I encourage it not to be some jive club. Go play someplace where people who are predisposed to like your thing are. Right? Don't make them come to you, go to them at the beginning. Same with you. Where are these people? Are they on some sort are they at coffee houses? Are they on some internet message board talking about some other mineral? I don't know. They're there. Go to them. Get them then to consider. Get them then to look at your offering. Oh, what is this? And we all do this about a billion times a day. We're hit with something and we look at it. Let's go back to chat roulette. You seem to like that, right? You flick, you click, you consider for a second, and most of the time you click right through, right? You gotta get them to look at it. And I'm telling you, we're inundated with stuff, so you gotta be quick. Here's my thing. Remember we talked about mission statements and mantras and stuff? You gotta be able to articulate your thing so fast. Then you want them to try it. Okay, I sign on to your mailing list. I'll listen to a download for an email address. Right? I'll try this thing that you do. I will have you detail my car. I will eat your lettuce. I will do whatever, right? Farm. And you see people going into stores offering, probably not lettuce, but something. Here, would you like a sample? Right? What do they want you to do? 
They want you to do this. But if it stops here, this will be a good test for you. You fail. <coughs> Why? What? Obtaining good. You get them to purchase. Is, are all of these steps easy or hard? Huh? Is it, is it easy or hard for some new product or service to pull any one of you to here? You just buy things indiscriminately? Well, no, I, I mean, I put it, I, I'm thinking about it as far as like the uni thing. Like, I mean, say you got your product, and like I said, this is a good product. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm trying to show you how to drop your nuts, and you keep going back to this. But even if you drop your nuts, you gotta have a good product. Because you can drop, if you, if you drop, if you drop your nuts, they ain't gonna respect your nuts unless you got some. <laughs> Let me just be real clear on something. People respect my nuts. <laughs> Mad respect. I do have a good product. It's not often referred to as a product, but it's a good one. My pants on the ground. What? Yes. Difference between quality <coughs> and good. I implore you all to make quality products, yeah. right? You can have something that's popular and doesn't have any quality and will fail, okay? You can have something that you might believe is good, doesn't have quality, will fail. But I think oh, well, yeah, that's what I mean. Quality is good. It's different. It's different. So I get you, I, I feel you, as I say. So in any case, you get up to here and you don't get to here, you fail. because irrespective of your point of view, which I respect, it's hard to get here. It's expensive to get here. And that's the thing. What? <laughs> yeah, well, expensive, hard, whichever adjective you'd like to use. It's, it's difficult, expensive, you know. And so it costs a lot, time, resources, everything, to finally get to here. And if they do it once, if they come to your website about slave minerals once, you fail. You need them to not only come again, you need them <coughs> to tell others, right? If somebody comes to your website once, you fail. It's expensive to get them. <coughs> if somebody comes to your concert once, you fail, okay? We've got to focus on repurchase. But you cannot bypass this journey. You cannot come up with something good and expect people just to know about it amazingly and buy it over and over again. You can't. <coughs> I know you don't like this. You can't. So up there where, where that black line is, let's just imagine that says product. And in parentheses, it says good or bad. It does not matter. You can't leapfrog all of these to this. You can't. No, no, I'm not saying that. But at the same time, if you got the bad product and you get to that purchase, you're not going to get a reverse. That's not true. <laughs> I mean, well, that's how I look at it. I'm not going to present a bad product just because of the It's bad. There are five people in here who buy these things, the blankets with the arms on them, and then everybody else laughs at them. These people that buy them think like, it's. That's comfy. <laughs> Somebody had a hand. Yes. Let's, let's jump start ahead. What do we call these people who like, or what, 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 how would we describe people that like the same things that we like? Good values, right? We, we share some ideas. Does it matter how old we are? It, it can. Does it always have to? No. Can, can, a, can an old dude like me like something that you like? Yes. Absolutely. Does it matter where we live? It can. But can we live in different places and like the same thing? So the first thing I mentioned was demographics, right? Different age, different <coughs> tax bracket, that type of thing. The second thing was geographics, right? But so what is the third thing 
we would call, huh? Look at you guys. How did you know that? Nobody ever knows that. <coughs> did I tell you? Somebody did, right? Billy? Did Billy tell you? Psychographics. All psychographics are, are things that transcend demographics and geographics, but they're shared. We <coughs> like them. And it doesn't matter if we're the same age, same color, same geographic location, okay? All right, back to the boring stuff. You've got to memorize these. Four P's of marketing. Sorry. Memorize. I hate, 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 hate forcing you to memorize. Product, price, place, promotion. Some people will add a fifth P to distribution. Don't worry about it. Four P's. Product, price, place, promotion. As you can see, this is a beautiful test question. How might I phrase it? Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah. Which one of these is not a 4P in marketing? Yes, it will be multiple choice. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to get to those four steps, we got to think. We got to look around. We've got to base our assessments on something solid. I may or may not require a final project, and in that final project, I may or may not require that you do some market research and use a database. Does anybody use these? Does the library teach you how to do this stuff? You have, what did you use? MediaMark. MediaMark. <coughs> Who's used MediaMark in here? And the other one uh, for the psychographics. No, I think I might make you do your Psychographic no, research on Facebook. No, it's not. Uh, no, that wasn't a question. Uh, do you think we could do our, our psychographic research on Facebook? I think psychographics is something you figure out after you go through demographics. Okay, that's fair enough. I just did a marketing for Facebook. Yeah, you should know how to use Medium Arc. I, I think it'd be interesting to see if you could do your data analysis. So, market what? Local audience market analysis. Yep. So to find the question, get veering close to entrepreneurship here. What are we trying to solve, right? What's the present situation? Is there a market for this? And I will tell you. Just because you don't find competitors, it may be good, maybe bad. A lot of people say, oh, I can't do this thing because somebody else is doing it. That's not bad necessarily. It means that there may be a market. On the other hand, if you can't find any competitors, that's not necessarily good. It may mean people have tried and it doesn't work. So you gotta look out there and, and see what the present situation is. Then you gotta go gather some data. And I really, I think you're right. You wanna do media marketing. You want to get as much data as you can from whatever source. I think the reason Facebook is so valuable is because they're a data repository. And it's, it's real psychographic data. Right? And then look at it. This is the start, the making of, of a marketing plan. And a lot of people never do this. Most fans don't. We make music. Right? Who are your fans? I don't know. Everybody, our music is good. <coughs> so you can look at it in the environment, right? And you should look at this through a various through various lenses. Just talking to somebody that wants to uh, get their <coughs> their band, their artist, or whatever, play in the performance arts center. Right, you know what these things are, the big kind of auditor uh, uh, venues where people pay and they pay a subscription, they go, and they, like Frederick Hall plays performance arts all the time. It's a terrible time to do this. Why? People are broke. So people are not going to buy year-long tickets to the PACs and not pay their electric bill. Okay? Not a good time, maybe, to open a PAC. Maybe it is. Maybe the market's poised to recover, and if you can get in early, Great, you know, but you gotta make a decision and you gotta look at all of these factors. <coughs> so 
a global fact, right? Growth of the internet changed everything. Okay, just talked about that more than I needed to. Anyway, it's all pretty explanatory. Don't worry right now if you don't know what macroeconomics means. We haven't covered that yet. Put simply, it just means that like GDP stuff, the whole nation. So the whole, like right now we're in recession, right? There are relative <laughs> pros and cons as to whether or not that's a good time or a bad time to start a business. In terms of getting money from banks, really bad, right? So global trends. <coughs> <laughs> You're not the dispositive beat. <laughs> More than one beat. So niche marketing, this, is, this becomes increasingly important. But I want you all to, to think clearly that just being small does not mean being small in profit really, really, really believe deeply and strongly that we're moving into, and already are in some respects, an era where three, four, ten people can, can do so much, right? Build so many things that become so profitable. But it is important to look at small markets. Because we just can't compete <coughs> We can't compete with the big guys, so we need to get <coughs> why? Why is the chalk back here on a whiteboard? Can't write on the chalk. Over there. Here in this curve, you've got the early adapters, people that do things first, right? Mavens, okay? people that are at the beginning. And you've got early majority, majority, late majority, and death. Okay? This is the product life cycle. Things start down here. Even Facebook, even Farmville, even Chat and Roulette, they all start here, for the most part. Then, if they can cross this chasm, and there are only two ways that things, guys, come on. There's only two ways that you can cross the chasm, right? How do we cross the chasm? Go ahead. no new skills but improves your life or create a product that improves your life by a factor of 10, right? In any case, we need to think about what's in here. What can we do that will get us some traction and jump over? Because if we start here, it's too expensive. <laughs> this is still the Nikes of the world. We can't come in and do that. We gotta do something cool and different and to improve the life or whatever and then maybe we can get up there. That's what niche marketing is. <coughs> Mass market is the opposite, right? If I am Nike and I do a new Air Jordan, 
I might do some in here. I might get it to certain tastemakers, but really I'm going to go here. Huge product, okay? Not really relevant to us, some of those products. <coughs> Bands always make this mistake. You were talking about radio, right? Radio is a mass market thing. You get on radio, big time radio, whatever, you can't start there, right? Unless you're already established, you got to start down here and build it up. But fans always, always, always think, oh, if I just get my song on radio, it doesn't work. But relationship marketing. This is retention. And again, this bothers me, this troubles me. I think it's more, it's different now. It's vendor relationship. It's you, the customer, telling me, the supplier, right? And that's discourse. Markets are conversations. But right now, you know, this idea of relationship marketing, just understand we've got to continue to innovate because any product or service, eventually, farm bills are going to head here. We'll get tired of it, right? What does that company have to do? They've got to have something here that's going up. So even while one's going down, they got another one, right? That's innovation. That's new features, whatever keep them by offering products that meet their wants, their needs, over time. So a customer, and this corresponds with the journey, right? This is sort of the customer journey in reverse, or from a different perspective. When you're thinking about buying something, first you realize you got an itch you want to scratch, right? Something I want. You start looking around. Think about how you do this on Amazon, okay? Oh, I heard about this thing. I'm going to look at it on Amazon. I go to Amazon, right? And maybe I Google it. I find all the products. First thing I do once I'm on Amazon, I look at the, star the, the reviews from the customers, right? If it's got less than three stars, I'm out of it. Make the purchase decision, and this, again, is where we get into the important part. Did it satisfy? Will I buy it again? And importantly, what else might I do? What do we as product suppliers want our customers to do? Spread the word. Tell them. So if my post-purchase evaluation involves me blogging about it, Twittering about it, putting it on Facebook, putting a star rating on Amazon, I, the manufacturer, win. As long as it's positive. Right? One of the airline's worst nightmares is Twitter. Because <coughs> you've got all these frustrated flyers out there going, Southwest sucks, I'm stuck, blah, blah, blah. Right? They've tried to address it, and JetBlue's doing a hell of a job. JetBlue has one of the biggest Twitter accounts going. Because they're using this as a way to work with their customers. Now, if I don't do anything at all, if I don't repurchase, if I don't talk, if I don't do anything, the manufacturer loses. Be free. 